Chapter 23 Jihad Our prophet, the messenger of our Lord, ordered us to fight you till you worship Allah alone. The conquest of Mecca began in the month in which the Quran prohibited fighting. Tabari, Allah's apostle set out on the expedition against the people of Mecca in the month of Ramadan. The prophet wasn't religious. He knew Islam's holy months were a farce. After all, he had stolen the dogma from a pagan. But why do Muslims follow a prophet who so blatantly ignored his God's orders? Quran 9, verse 5. When the sacred forbidden months for fighting are past, fight and kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. Take them captive, beleaguer them, and lie in wait, and ambush them using every stratagem of war. The Hadith vainly tries to explain the reason for the raid, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The Muslim militants were manhandled at Muta. They came home empty-handed, with their tails between their legs. Muhammad was a whisper away from losing control. The mercenary Muslims wanted booty, and the peaceful Muslims wanted to be left alone. So Muhammad needed an easy kill, and he needed it now. The last four times he had been in this predicament, Muhammad had besieged Jewish settlements. But alas, he had overhunted them there were no more Jews to plunder. So Medina's warlord needed a new patsy, a sure thing, a toothless tiger. And he was in luck. His unrelenting terrorist campaign had destroyed the Meccans economically, and his treaty had deceived them into letting down their defenses. They were now vulnerable. Ishak, after sending his expedition to Muta. The messenger learned that the Banu Bakr had assaulted the Kuza'a, while the latter were at a watering place in Lower Mecca. There was some strife over a merchant who had been robbed and killed. Surprisingly enough, it hadn't been perpetrated by a Muslim. You may be wondering why the Hadith would bother with such trivia. By this time, Muhammad had led scores of terrorist raids. Collectively, Team Islam had robbed, murdered, enslaved, and raped tens of thousands of men, women, and children. So there must have been a reason for highlighting this assault. Could it be that the Islamic sages were fishing for an excuse to renege on their peace treaty and justify Muhammad's invasion of Mecca? Tabari, matters stood thus between the Banu Bakr and the Kuza'a when Islam intervened to separate them and occupy people's minds. In other words, they used to be friends before Islam poisoned Arabia. The Bakr entered into a peace pact with the Quraysh, and the Kuza'a entered into a pact with the Muslims. The truce having been concluded, the Banu Bakr took advantage of it against the Kuza'a. To retaliate, they wanted to kill the persons responsible for killing their men. So the Bakr killed a Kuza'a man. The Quraysh aided the Bakr with weapons. And some Quraysh fought on their side under the cover of darkness until they drove the Kuza'a into the sacred territory. Keep in mind, all of this was taking place in Mecca. The Kuza'a had come bearing arms. The Quraysh didn't go out looking for trouble. By protecting their own town and honoring an alliance they had formed with the Bakr, the Quraysh were accused of attacking the Kuza'a, a tribe supposedly allied with the Muslims. But there's a problem the Islamic sages didn't count on. We can read. The breach was bogus. If the Bakr were allied with the Quraysh, then the Muslims had violated the treaty, not the Meccans. Tabari documents an Islamic raid against the Bakr after Hudabaya, late in the seventh year, along with another score of Muslim treaty violations. Ishak called the affair a quarrel over a man who had gone on a trading journey, also known as a business trip. While the man was mugged and murdered, neither victim nor villain was Meccan or Muslim. Tabari and Ishak the Banu Bakr said, We have entered the sacred territory. Be mindful of your God. To which they replied, Today we have no God, so we'll take our revenge. 
That night, the Bakr attacked the Kuza'a and killed a man named Munabi. He had a weak heart. He said, I am as good as dead anyway, whether they kill me or not, for my weak heart has ceased beating. The others ran away and escaped. Munabi was caught and killed. When the Quraysh leagued together with the Bakr against the Kuza'a and killed some men, one died of natural causes, not some, and Baker caught him, not the Quraysh. They broke the treaty because of the pact the Kuza'a had with Muhammad. This was one of the things that prompted the conquest of Mecca. <laughs> These boys are as predictable as tomorrow's sunrise. The Muslim militants, who had betrayed their fellow Arabs while terrorizing and robbing every neighboring town, explained, Tabari, among the terms on which the messenger and Quraysh had made peace was that there should be neither betrayal nor clandestine theft. The Quraysh aided the Bakr with weapons. That is why Muhammad attacked the people of Mecca. Muhammad's excuse was as pathetic as his behavior and both were as lame as the Islamic apologists. Universally, they report that the Meccans had it coming because they aggressively and violently breached the peace treaty that had been steadfastly honored by Muhammad. Nothing could be further from the truth, but truth has never been popular in Islam. Tabari. Kuza'a men came to the messenger and told him how the Quraysh had backed the Bakr against them. The prophet replied, I think you will see Abu Sufyan, the leading Meccan merchant, come to strengthen the pact and extend the term. And he did, not knowing that the treaty was just one of Allah's many plots. Tabari and Ishak. Abu Sufyan went to Muhammad in Mecca to affirm the peace treaty. Upon arriving, he visited his own daughter, Um. When he was about to sit on the carpet bed of the prophet, she folded it up to stop him. He said, My daughter, I do not know if you think that I am too good for this bed, or if the carpet is too good for me. Um replied, In the recent style of one infected by Islam, You are an unclean polytheist. Abu answered, Insightfully, My daughter, by Allah, evil came over you after you left me. You have gone bad. Ishak. Then Abu Sufyan went to Allah's messenger, but he refused to speak to him. Muhammad had no interest in peace. He wanted submission. He wanted booty and death. Tabari. Sufyan went to Abu Bakr and asked him to intercede, but he refused. When Sufyan asked Umar to help avert war, he replied, no way! By Allah, if I had only ant grubs, I would fight you with them. Ignorant of Islam, the foolish negotiator went the extra mile to achieve the impossible. Peace with an Islamic dictator. Abu Sufyan went to the man who would be Caliph, Ali, and his wife Fatima, Muhammad's son-in-law and his daughter. Ali said, Woe to you, Sufyan! When the messenger has determined a thing, it is useless for anyone to talk to him. Islam was and always has been dictatorial. The polygious doctrine of submit and obey knows nothing of free speech or democracy. Ishak, Fatima said, No one can provide any protection against Allah's apostle. And that is the lesson of history. Self-proclaimed tyrants and dictators start wars. Freely elected presidents and prime ministers seldom do. The political doctrines of Islam, communism, fascism, and Nazism concentrate power in the hands of single individuals. To maintain their authority, despots establish regimes that are as brutal on their own people as they are violent against their neighbors. Muhammad was a textbook example. The first Islamic historian confirms, Tabari, there is nothing that you can do to make peace with him. So Abu Sufyan stood in the mosque and said, People, I came to make peace. I promise protection between men. But the offer was unilateral, so he mounted his camel and departed. Sufyan, like most Arabs before Islam, wanted to live freely and in peace. He wanted to earn a living 
and care for his family. But those were things Mohammed couldn't tolerate. Islam had to be imposed to survive. It had to plunder to live. Doctrinally bankrupt, he knew that his Sunnah and Quran would never withstand the scrutiny of a free society. And morally bankrupt, it could not provide the level of trust needed for a free economy. So Muslims were destined to lose their liberties. They were transformed into parasites. Islam conquered them, deceived them, corrupted them, and then it damned them. Tabari. When Abu Sufyan reported back to the Quraysh that Muhammad had given him no reply, they said, Woe to you! By Allah, he did no more than play with you. Back in the pirate's den. Ishak. Muhammad commanded the people to prepare for the foray. Raid, incursion, shorty, attack, or assault. The messenger informed his troops that he was going to Mecca. He ordered them to prepare themselves and ready their equipment quickly. He said, O oh Allah, keep spies and news from the Quraysh until we take them by surprise in their land. Fundamental Islamic organizations like Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and Al-Qaeda offer the same prayer today. Ishak Hassan incited the men, reciting, This is the time for war. Don't feel safe from us. Our swords will open the door to death. And so it would be forevermore. Tabari. He departed on the tenth day of Ramadan. They broke their fast and encamped at Mar Zaran with ten thousand Muslims. No news reached the Quraysh about the messenger, and they did not know what he would do. I beg to differ. Allah's boy had been a non-stop pirate and an insatiable terrorist for eight years now. The Meccans were under no illusions. It was the Muslims who were deceived. In their prophet's presence, the first Muslims broke several of Islam's five pillars. They ignored the Ramadan fast. They attacked the town whose people had invented Allah, and they ceased their prostrations so that they could kill. Tabari. When the messenger set out for Mecca, he appointed no one to military commands and displayed no banners. He was using deceptive tactics. Then he begged for help. He sent to the Arab tribes, but they hung back from him. Given a choice, most Arabs chose not to align themselves with his religion. Yet, sadly, there were enough militants willing to sell their soul for a buck. When Muhammad reached Kudayd, the Suliyam met him with horses and full armament. Uyena joined the messenger at Arj. Akra joined at Sukya. Tabari. When Muhammad encamped at Mar Zaran, Abbas said, Woe to the Quraysh! If Allah's apostle surprises them in their territory and enters Mecca by force, it means the destruction of the Quraysh. Looking out at the Muslim encampments on the hills surrounding Mecca, Abu Sufyan said, I have never seen fires like those I see today. These are the fires of men gathered for war. Here is Muhammad. Come against us with a force we cannot resist. Ten thousand Muslims. If he gets a hold of me, he will cut off my head. Abu Sufyan was captured by a Muslim eager to do just that. He brought him shackled to Muhammad, who demanded, Recorded in Tabari and Ishak, Alas, Sufian, isn't it time for you to admit that I am the messenger of Allah? Sufian replied, As to that, I have some doubt. But that wasn't an acceptable answer, so Abbas shrieked, Woe to you! Submit and recite the testimony that there is no Illah but Allah, and that Muhammad is the Apostle of Allah, before your head is cut off. That was original Islam in action. Submit or die. Testify that there is no Illah but Allah, and that would include Yahweh and the Messiah, or lose your head. Then recite, Muhammad is the Apostle of Allah as opposed to Moses, Peter, Paul, or John. Or else... 
Muhammad told Abbas to detain Abu Sufyan by the spur of the mountain in the narrow part of the valley until the troops of Allah passed by him. Then Ishaq tells us, The apostle punched him in the chest before he was hauled away. Tabari and Ishaq. Finally, the squadrons of the messenger, composed of emigrants and Ansar in iron armor with only their eyes visible passed by his company had become great woe to you none can withstand him it was all due to his prophetic office the polygious doctrine of islam had served mohammed well tradition indicates that sufian was freed once the muslims had taken up their positions surrounding mecca ishaq Abu Sufyan ran in haste. When he reached Mecca, he shouted in the sanctuary, People of the Quraysh, behold, Muhammad has come upon us with forces we cannot resist. Hind, the woman who had lost her son, her husband, her father, and her brother to Islam's butchery at Badar, said, Kill this fat, greasy bladder of lard. What a rotten protector of the people. Woe to you, Sufin replied. Don't let this woman deceive you, for we cannot resist Islam. Muhammad had offered Abu Sufyan a deal he could not refuse. Surrender or die. Hind correctly recognized that the Meccan chief had become a traitor. The prophet was on the warpath. He was now within reach of fulfilling Khadijah's aspirations, the profitable prophet plan. And all of Mecca would be humbled, humiliated for having rejected him. Tabari. Heading for Mecca, the prophet sent Zubiar after the Quraysh. He gave him his banner and appointed him commander over the cavalry of emigrants and Ansar. He ordered, Zubiar, plant my banner in the upper part of Mecca. Remain there until I come to you. Ishak says that the prophet showed his true colors that day. He and his men were festooned in green and black. Green is symbolic of envy the root cause of Islam. Black is the color of deceit and death, the result of Islam. Then speaking of the dark spirit that inspired and possessed Muhammad, his biographer reports, Ishak, by Allah the black mass has spread. Also Ishak, Abu Bakr said there is not much honesty among people nowadays. One thing simply led to the other. Tabari and Ishak. The prophet sent out his army in divisions. Zubiar was in charge of the left wing. He was ordered to make an entry with his forces from Kuda. Saad was commanded to enter with forces by way of Kada. Allah's apostle said, Today is a day of battle and war. Sanctuary is no more. Today the sacred territory is deemed profane ungodly, irreverent, wicked, and sacrilegious. When one of the muhajirs, the emigrants, heard him say this, he warned the apostle, It is to be feared that you would resort to violence. The prophet ordered Ali to go after him, take the flag from him, and fight with it himself. A less corrupt man suggests that profaning God and resorting to violence might not be a very good idea, and he was rebuked. The debate between religion and politics, peace and violence, had taken place once again. And, as always, Islam's founder made the wrong call. There is no Islam apart from Muhammad, and he has spoken. Are you listening? Bukhari Allah's apostle said on the day of the conquest of Mecca, There is no migration now, only jihad, holy battle. And when you were called for jihad, you should come out at once. The message is as clear as Mein Kampf. It's as undeniable as Pearl Harbor. It's as brutal as 9-11. There is only jihad. Hitler, interestingly enough, repeated Mohammed's line on the morning he invaded Poland. He said, 
There is no more emigration now, only war. This hadith confirms that Islam's prophet wasn't out being religious. Muslim, I said, should I tell you a hadith from your traditions? He gave an account of the conquest of Mecca, saying, Muhammad, may peace be upon him, advanced until he reached Mecca. He assigned Zubiar to his right flank, and Killer. Khalid to his left. Then he dispatched Ubaidah with the force that had no armor. They advanced to the interior. The prophet, may peace be upon him, was in the midst of a large contingent of his fighters. Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, said, You see the ruffians and the lowly followers of the Quraysh? He indicated by striking one of his hands over the other that they should be killed. So we went off on his orders, and if anyone wanted a person killed, he was slain. No one could offer any resistance. Then, the recently converted, Abu Sufyan said, Messenger, the blood of the Quraysh has become very cheap. The prophet said, Kill all who stand in your way. If this is the criterion for being God's messenger, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Lenin, and Adolf Hitler were prophets too. At this point, the historian's account conflicts somewhat with Muslims' collection, so we can draw the conclusion that much of this is untrue, as contradiction is proof of deceit. We can view Tabati as an apologist, someone interested in buffing up his prophet's bloody reputation. Or perhaps, Muhammad may have had some second thoughts. He may have been more interested in humiliating his prey than devouring them. But either way, we're told Meccan's abandoned orphan dispatched his troops, crying, Tabari, fight only those who fight you. When Khalid came upon them in the lower part of Mecca, he fought them, and Allah put them to flight. Zubiyar encountered a squadron of Quraysh on the slopes of Kada and killed them. Alas, the debate became moot. Khalid fought them. And? Zubiyar killed them. So? When the prophet arrived, the people stood before him to swear allegiance to him. So the Meccans became Muslims. One who submits. And that's all you really need to know about Muhammad in Islam. He had conquered his demon. He had avenged his childhood. The praise, power, and possessions he had been denied were now his. Islam had worked like a charm. It had always been about subduing the Meccans, making them pay for abandoning him, making them wish they hadn't kept the family business for themselves. All they needed to do was surrender, to grovel at his feet. Surah 48, 28 reads, You will see them bow and prostrate themselves, seeking Allah's acceptance. On their faces are their marks, the traces of their prostration. As you no doubt noticed, throughout this disgusting affair, Allah has been nothing more than an implement the Meccans swore their allegiance to Muhammad. That is what made them Muslims, one who submits. Allah was used to disavow the treaty, to justify killing, to steal the Kaaba, and to empower Muhammad. In conflict with the evidence, Muslim apologists say that the conflict of Mecca was a peaceful affair, yet many men and women were butchered on this horrific day. Ishak, the Muslims met them with their swords. They cut through many arms and skulls. Only confused cries and groans could be heard over our battle roars and snarling. With his kin confused and in agony, Tabari and Ishak, Muhammad ordered that certain men should be assassinated, even if they were found behind the curtains of the Kaaba. Among them was Abdallah bin Sa'd the Quran's first scribe. The reason that Allah's messenger ordered that he should be slain was because he had become a Muslim and used to write down the Quran revelation. Then he apostatized, reverted to being a polytheist, and returned to Mecca. 
the only man who ever attempted to commit Quran surahs to parchment as they left the Prophet's lips rejected Islam. That ought to send a shiver up every Muslim's spine. The only contemporaneous Quran scribe was hunted down by Muhammad. Islam's prophet ordered Muslims to assassinate the first man who attempted to turn the Quran into a book. Tabari. Abdallah bin Saad fled to Uthman, his brother, who, after hiding him, finally surrendered him to the prophet. Uthman asked for clemency. Muhammad did not respond, remaining silent for a long time. Muhammad explained, By Allah, I kept silence, so that one of you might go up to him and cut off his head. One of the Ansars said, Why didn't you give me a sign? Allah's apostle said, A prophet does not kill by pointing. No, he kills by deceiving, by seducing, and by coercing. And lest we forget... He kills by establishing false religions, the most virulent and vicious form of mass murder, the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. Confirming that this had nothing to do with Allah, Muhammad ordered the assassination of another Muslim. Dabadi and Ishaq Among those whom Muhammad ordered killed was Abdallah bin Qatal. The messenger ordered him to be slain because, while he was a Muslim, Muhammad had sent him to collect the zakat taxes with an Ansar and a slave of his. Long story short, the slave disobeyed, so the Muslim tax collector killed him. Rather than face the music by reporting his misdeed to the boss, Abdallah turned tail rejected Islam, and used his spoils to acquire the talents of a couple of girls. The girls used to sing satire about Muhammad, so the prophet ordered that they should be killed along with Abdullah. Abdullah was killed by Saad and Abu Barza. The two shared in his blood. One of the singing girls was killed quickly, but the other fled. So Umar caused his horse to trample the one who fled at Atba, killing her. Mohammed, like his protege Hitler, suffered as a result of being abused as a child. Insecure men are enraged by criticism. They will stop at nothing to silence anyone who irritates them. Ishak. Another victim was Huarith. He used to insult Muhammad in Mecca. Huarith was put to death by Ali. The next victim of this godfather's hit list was Mikyas, the messenger ordered his assassination only because he had killed an Ansar who had killed his brother by mistake, and then became a renegade by rejecting Islam. So much for, there should be no compulsion in religion. Mikyas was slain by Numalya. Tabari then recounts in volume 8, page 180. Also among those eliminated were Ikrimah bin Abu Jal and Sarah, a slave of one of Abdimutalib's sons. She taunted Muhammad while he was in Mecca. The prophet had notched his ninth kill, in addition to those men and women whose arms and skulls had been cut off in the raid. To body. According to Wakiti, the messenger ordered that six men and four women should be assassinated. One of these women was Hind, who swore allegiance and became a Muslim. His bloodlust satiated, it was time to solve his soul. Tabari. Having halted by the door of the Kaaba, the messenger stood up and said, There is no Illah but Allah alone. He has no partner. That's because Muhammad and Allah were one. And now that Muhammad had claimed the founder's share of the Kaaba ink, the last thing he wanted was a partner. Ishak, behold, every alleged claim of inherited privilege, blood, wealth, or property is abolished by me, except the custody of the Kaaba and the rights to supply water to the pilgrims. It's the ultimate confession. The first chance he gets, Muhammad announces that the alleged claims to the Kaaba, to Kusay's religious scam, are null and void. Heredity, privilege, property, and wealth will avail the Meccans no longer. 
Then, Mohammed makes himself an exception. He takes custody of the Kaaba. It's the fulfillment of Khadijah's profitable prophet plan. Islam had worked. Having achieved his life's ambition, the prophet gloats, Tabari, people of the Quraysh, Allah has taken from you the haughtiness of the time of ignorance and its veneration of ancestors. For now I have humbled you, made you Muslims submissive unto me. People of the Quraysh and people of Mecca, what do you think I intend to do with you? Rub their noses in it, literally. He needed them to grovel at his feet, to bow down and swear allegiance to him. He wanted what he had always craved, to be praised and to be obeyed, to be empowered and to be enriched. Killing more Meccans wouldn't be any fun. He had done enough of that. No, he wanted to see them humiliated. Tabari and Ishak, the people assembled in Mecca to swear allegiance to the messenger in submission. They gathered to do homage to the apostle in Islam. Umar remained below the prophet, lower than the place where he sat, on his elevated throne, imposing conditions on the people as they paid homage, or reverence, to Muhammad, promising to submit and obey. Umar administered the oath, receiving from the Meccans their pledge of allegiance to Muhammad. They promised to heed and obey Allah and his messenger. And since no one spoke for Allah but Muhammad, there were no orders but Muhammad's, and thus no one to be obeyed but him. That was the oath administered to those who swore allegiance to the Prophet in submission, or Islam. Tabari, when the messenger was finished with the men's swearing of allegiance, the women swore allegiance. Having been abandoned by all of the women in his life, Muhammad was particularly harsh on them. You are swearing allegiance to me, on condition that you will associate nothing with Allah. And by default, me. By Allah, you are imposing something on us that you did not impose on the men, one of the women said. Muhammad paid her no heed, and continued with his list. When he got to, Do not kill your children, the woman said, we raised them, and you killed them. You know better about killing them than we do. Umar laughed immoderately at her words. But the messenger did not think it was funny. The truth hurt. His only response was to call the truth a lie, or at least to sequester the messenger. He said, Do not invent slanderous tales henceforth. For a terrorist, Mohammed was very thin-skinned. The woman's line was one of the great comebacks of all time, and she had earned the right to say it, for Muhammad's goons had murdered her father, her brother, her husband, and her son. Hind said, bringing slander is ugly. Sometimes it's better to just ignore it. He said, you shall not disobey me in carrying out my orders. The messenger told Umar, receive their oath of allegiance and their homage. Now go, for I have accepted your allegiance and praise. The abused was now an abuser, and the abused abuser craved the one thing he never knew, love. Before we move on with the narrative, I want you to appreciate the dynamics of this situation. Everything was intensely personal. Mecca was an isolated and shabby collection of mud huts. Every Meccan knew every other Meccan, and most were related. It isn't by chance that Mohammed knew the names of everyone he had killed in each of his raids on the Quraysh, or that his militants were killing their fathers and their brothers. This was a family feud, a quarrel over who should inherit Kusay's scam. Islam was a consequence. It happened, as did Mein Kampf, because a child was denied. I took great pains to expose the true nature of Mecca, Kusay's adventure, and the circumstances surrounding Muhammad's birth, so that you might know why the abused boy claimed that he was Allah's messenger. 
by sharing what the Quran had to say about the pleasures of paradise and the torments of hell, we came to know what pleased and tortured Muhammad, and thus what motivated him. His every word indeed, his Quran and Sunnah, were derivatives of the abuse he suffered. And his rage was magnified when his family failed to rescue him. Islam was one man's quest for revenge. Muhammad was powerless, poor, and unloved. Therefore his Islam was focused on power, money, and sex. It's as simple and sad as that. Tabari and Ishak Allah had enabled Muhammad to take the persons of the Quraysh by force, giving him power over them so that they were his booty. Their lives were now his spoil, but he emancipated them. No, he enslaved them. That's what an oath of allegiance and submission is all about. But by not selling his possessions, his booty, into slavery, he was perceived as merciful. When a kidnapper stops tormenting victims, they view the reprieve as a form of mercy. In a twisted sort of way, it ultimately causes the molested to see their molestor as loving. This is why Muslims rewrite their history and revere the man who enslaved them. But just humiliating the Meccans was insufficient. The prophet knew their praise and homage was insincere, so he continued to look for love in all of the wrong places. Tabari, the sixty-year-old messenger of Allah, married Muleika. She was young and beautiful. One of the prophet's wives came to her and said, Are you not ashamed to marry a man who killed your father during the day he conquered Mecca? She therefore took refuge from him. Now that he had conquered his demons, it was time for Muhammad to pay his respects. Ishak, when the populace had settled down, Muhammad went to the Kaaba and compassed it seven times on his camel, touching the black stone with a stick. Then he went inside the temple. There he found a dove made of wood. He broke it in his hands and threw it away. It's perfect. The first idol Muhammad broke was the international symbol of peace and the symbol of Yahweh's spirit. So may the truth be known. Ishak, the Kaaba contained three hundred and sixty idols, which Lucifer had strengthened with lead. The apostle was standing by them with his stick in his hand, saying, The truth has come, and falsehood has passed away. Then he pointed at them with his stick, and they collapsed on their backs one after the other. The Kaaba was a pagan shrine, and a rotten one at that. It had never been anything more. But on this day, Muhammad helped his dark spirit eliminate the competition. The same stick that had recognized the black stone toppled the other false gods. Ishak, the Quraysh had put pictures in the Kaaba, including two of Jesus and one of Mary, on both of whom be peace. Muhammad ordered that the pictures should be erased. So then, after stealing the pagan shrine, Ishak reveals... Muhammad sat in the mosque, and Ali came to him with the key to the Kaaba, asking him to grant his family the rights associated with custodianship. But alas, the Shiite didn't measure up. The mighty Mo handed the key to Uthman for safekeeping. Then, stealing a line from the scriptures, the dim-witted, delusional degenerate proclaimed, Ishak, Mecca is the holy of holies. But even Satan knows that's not true, which is why he will desecrate the real Holy of Holies on Mount Moriah in the last days. It's why Islam's first real shrine was built upon the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The blood that flowed from the broken bodies of men and women killed by the Muslims this day had yet to dry when the chief hypocrite said, Ishak. It is not lawful for anyone to shed blood in Mecca. 
It was not lawful to anyone before me, and it will not be lawful after me. If anyone should say, the apostle killed men in Mecca, say, Allah permitted his apostle to do so, but he does not permit you. In the poetry that accompanied the raid, we discover, Ishak, Allah gave you a seal imprinted. This is the seal of prophethood, which was actually just a hairy mole. Allah's proof is great. Now there's a delusional thought. I testify that your religion is true and that you are great among men. Allah testifies that Ahmad, this was Muhammad's chosen name, which means praised, is the chosen. You are a noble one, the sinisher. A sinisher is someone who attracts attention or admiration upon himself. Of the righteous, a prince. A misguided soul shouted, Ishak, Gabriel, Allah's messenger, is with us, and the Holy Spirit has no equal. Muhammad mistook Satan for Gabriel, and thus Muslims wrongly believed that Gabriel was the Holy Spirit. One lie simply led to another. Another orator recited, Allah said, I have sent an army. Every day they curse, battle, and lampoon. Then speaking of the prince, the poet proclaimed, He is the pure, blessed Hanif. While Muhammad was once a wannabe Hanif, the Hanifs were never Muslims. They rejected this prophet and his God. He is Allah's trusted one, whose nature is loyalty. Muhammad had just dissolved his vows and reneged on a treaty, so Muslims have a misguided definition of trust and loyalty. Another shared in this era. We expelled the people and smote them with our swords. The day the good prophet entered Mecca, we pierced their bodies with cuts and thrusts. We shot them with our feathered shafts. Our ranks went in with lances leveled. We came to plunder as we said we would. We pledged our faith to the apostle on this day of fear. Now there's an honest Muslim. We came to plunder as we said we would. Pledging, piercing, and plundering behind us, Muhammad decided to get religious. Ishak, the apostles sent out troops to the territory surrounding Mecca, inviting men to Allah. Among those he sent was Khalid. He was ordered to go as a missionary. Khalid subdued the Jadima and killed some of them. Troops don't deliver invitations. They deliver ultimatums. Khalid was Muhammad's most vicious terrorist. Calling him a missionary is a perverted joke. He wants to find himself bragging. I am the sword of Allah and the sword of his messenger. You'd think that after Muhammad had achieved his life's ambition, he'd tell his militants to lay down their swords. But such was not the case. A man plagued by insecurity can never be satiated. Tabari and Ishak, Alas for you, Banu Jadima, it is Khalid, by Allah, after you lay down your weapons it will be nothing but leather manacles, and after the manacles nothing but the cutting off of heads. After they had laid down their arms, Khalid ordered that their hands should be tied behind their backs. Then he put them to the sword, smiting their necks, killing them. When the word got to Muhammad as to what Khalid had done, he said, I declare that I am innocent of Khalid's deeds. Sorry, pal. Muhammad was responsible for the party. He preached the sermons and recited the surahs that had led to this. His sunnah and his scripture were clear. Good Muslims kill. Jihad is the best deed in Islam. But Muhammad was a weasel. He never accepted responsibility for anything. He had always claimed that it had been his God who had terrorized, who had robbed, enslaved, and murdered. Not him. And Muhammad never actually disavowed Khalid. He went on to become the Prophet's best general and most effective tax collector. Ishak, one of the Banu Jadima, 
who had been victimized by Khalid, said, God take reprisals on the Muslims for the evil they did to us. They stole our goods and divided them. Their spears came at us, not once, but twice. Their squadrons came upon us like a swarm of locusts. Were it not for the religion of Muhammad, their cavalry would never have attacked. And if not for Muhammad's religion, terrorists wouldn't be terrorizing us today. This brings us to another revealing tale, the assassination of Allah's daughters. Ishak, the apostle sent Khalid to destroy the idol Aluza in the lowland of Nakla. The Quraysh used to venerate her temple. When Sulami heard of Khalid's approach, he hung his sword on Aluza, climbed a mountain, and shouted, O oh, Uza, make an annihilating attack on Khalid! Throw aside your veil! Muhammad stole Islam's veil from the pagans, too. And gird up your train. O oh, Uza, if you do not kill Khalid, then bear swift punishment or become a Christian. The custodian of al Uza's temple told his pagan idol to become a Christian. Sure, I believe that. When Khalid arrived, he destroyed her and returned to the apostle. Tabari, I have destroyed it, he said to Muhammad. Did you see anything? No. Then Muhammad said, Go back and kill her. So Khalid returned to the idol. He destroyed her temple and broke her graven image. The shrine's keeper began, saying, Rage, O Uza, display one of your fits of rage. Whereupon a naked, wailing Ethiopian woman came out before him. Khalid killed her and took the jewels that were on her. Then he went back to Allah's messenger and gave him a report. That was Aluza, Muhammad said. Aluza will never be worshipped again. Holy rock of the Kaaba! Why didn't somebody put this demented stone worshipper out of his misery? Khalid murdered the wrong idol. He should have slain Muhammad. Islam's lone prophet just confessed that the pagan rock idol Aluza was a real live goddess. She was a naked African woman. It's unfathomable that Muslim militants blow innocence into oblivion based upon this man's testimony. All bad things must eventually come to an end. Glory be to God. The fifth surah is the last of a lousy lot. With it the heavenly fraud was finished. The feast opens as one would expect from a doctrine named submission. Quran 5, verse 1. Believers fulfill obligations. Verse 2. Believers violate not the sanctity of the symbols of Allah. The Kaaba, the crescent moon, and the black stone. Nor of the sacred month. Which Muhammad had violated to acquire Allah's symbols. Fear Allah, for Allah is severe in punishment. Muhammad's mantra never changed. The Quran provides a long list of prohibitions. Quran 5 verse 3 Forbidden to you are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, that which has been killed by strangling, or by a violent blow, or by a headlong fall, or by being gored to death, or that which hath been eaten by a wild animal. This day those who reject faith give up all hope of your religion, yet fear them not, fear me. This day I have perfected your religion, and I have chosen for you submission as your religion. Putting the commentary on not eating dead animals aside, the change of voice from Fear Allah, for Allah is severe, to Fear me, for I have perfected your religion is revealing. At best, the shift suggests that the author wasn't skilled at his craft, something that would be inconsistent with God. At worst, it's another confession. Muhammad slipped into first person because he was Allah. And the only thing perfected on this day was Muhammad's claim to the Kaaba. The only thing religious about any of this was the tyrant's use of the dogma to subdue his people. The next verse confirms what Islamic clerics deny and what the American media ignores. Allah is the name of the Islamic God. It was never the Arabic word for God. 
Quran 5 verse 4, pronounce the name of Allah and fear Allah, for Allah is swift in reckoning. Every time you read the word God in an Associated Press article emanating from the Islamic world, know that they are propagating this deception. Muslims have a perfectly good word for God, and they use it with great regularity. They say, There is no Allah but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. This deception lies at the very core of Islam, and thus of Islamic terror. If Allah isn't Yahweh, the Quran is rubbish. It's a horrid job of plagiarizing, nothing more. If Allah isn't Yahweh, Muhammad was speaking on his own behalf and for his own benefit. He could not have been among the line of biblical prophets. If Allah isn't Yahweh, the God of Islam is fictitious, an impotent mirage. But knowing that most people are blissfully ignorant, unwilling to read or think for themselves, they'll never know that Allah is the inverse of Yahweh. So this ruse works. Ritual is the substance of religion, the control mechanism for obedience, the opiate of the people. Quran 5 verse 6 O oh, you who believe, when you prepare for prayer, wash your faces and your hands to the elbows, rub your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. If you are in a state of sexual discharge, bathe your whole body. But if you are ill, on a journey, or come from the privy, or have been in contact with women and find no water, then take clean dirt and rub it on your faces and hands. But why bother to pray? The very same God that is ordering Muslims to rub dirt in their faces proclaimed. Quran 78 verse 37, None shall have power to argue with the Lord. None can converse with Him or address Him. If that is true, prayer is a waste of time. If it isn't true, then Allah is a liar, which makes Him the wrong God to pray to. And lest I forget, Muhammad just said, women are dirtier than dirt. This may be the last surah, but there is no evidence Muhammad and Allah got better with practice. Quran 5 verse 7 Remember Allah's covenant, which he ratified with you, when you said, We hear and obey, and fear Allah. The covenant which they ratified was the pledge of allegiance to Muhammad. This was another confession. Allah and Muhammad were one. This man created his God. The personality Muhammad attributes to Allah was as ugly as his own. Quran 5 verse 10 Those who reject, disbelieve, and deny our signs, proofs, verses, and lessons will be companions of hell fire. Returning to familiar religious patter, Muhammad slipped again. Allah was now plural. Could it be that they were a team, partners? Might Allah be to Muhammad what Mickey Mouse was to Walt Disney, a means to fame and fortune? Or did Muhammad know the truth? Did he recognize what he sensed the night this all began? I fear that I have been possessed. Then, in a desperate attempt to legitimize his counterfeit, Muhammad attempted to usurp Yahweh's authority. Whether deceived, delusional, or just dishonest, these erroneous claims are advanced to cast Allah as Yahweh and to authenticate Islam. Quran 5.12 Indeed, Allah made a covenant of old with the children of Israel, and we appointed twelve captains among them. And Allah said, I am with you if you perform regular prayers. Obligatory Islamic worship. Pay the zakat tax with regularity. The zakat was from Kusay, not Abraham. Believe in my messengers. Muhammad is referring to himself, not knowing that Yahweh never used humans as messengers. Angels are Yahweh's messengers. It is what the Hebrew and Greek word for angel means. Men were called to be teachers, to be prophets and priests. Obey and support the messengers, i.e., fight for Islam, and loan Allah a beautiful loan. Yahweh didn't need money, 
but Mohammed did to advance his war machine. Verily I will wipe out your evils, and embit you to gardens with rivers flowing. But if any of you, after this message from Mohammed, resist, you have wandered astray. Not only did Mohammed falsely claim that his Islamic mantra was Jewish doctrine, his voice slipped back out of plural to singular, our to my. He didn't get any better at this, even with practice. Further, the biblical paradise isn't about rivers, and godly loans aren't equated to forgiveness. To help us understand these verses, the noble Quran adds, The Jews were ordered in the Torah to follow Prophet Muhammad. The noble Quran references Surah 7157. Those who follow the messenger, Muhammad, the prophet who can neither read nor write, whom they find written in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 18.15, and the Gospel, John 14.16, he commands them to Islam. We've been through this drill before. While Team Islam couldn't read, I can. I can assure you that no Arab was called a prophet, and that no man was called a messenger. But he was right in a way. When the Bible spoke of Satan, it said that he would use prostration, taxation, terror, a new gospel, and a boastful false prophet to deceive mankind. Since the Quran translators were kind enough to provide the alleged Torah and gospel references, let's review them. First, Deuteronomy 8.15. It begins, Yahweh therefore not Allah, your Elohim, or deity, shall rise up and ordain for you a man who speaks by inspiration, predicting and teaching, from the midst or heart of you, from your brethren, i.e., a Jew, like me. You shall hear him. So that was a repudiation of Muhammad's claims, not a confirmation. A better verse would have been the 18th, but only if taken out of context, as Yahweh is speaking through Moses about his tribe, the priestly Levites, and about the Messiah who would come from the tribe of Judah. So in Yahweh's voice we read, I will raise up an inspired prophet and teacher from their midst or heart, a brother like Moses, who will ascribe my advice and counsel through his mouth, and he shall speak all that I appoint for him. And if anyone fails to heed the words he speaks in my name and authority, I will call him to account. But the prophet who presumptuously subdues, the word is debar, imposes submission or Islam, and recites a book in my name which I have not commanded him to utter, or who speaks in the name of other Elohim, gods like Allah, for example, that prophet shall die. While the 15th and 18th verses referred to Yeshua, the Messiah, not Mohammed, the perverted pirate, the 22nd verse was prophetic of Allah's apostle and of his presumptuous recital, but not in a positive way. Team Islam claims John 14.16 contains the gospel prediction of Muhammad's arrival. So that we don't err by taking Yeshua's words out of context, I'll begin with the sixth verse. Yeshua said, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one appears before the Father, but through me. Therefore, not through Muhammad. If you know or understand me, you know and understand my Father also. You have seen, experienced, and beheld Him. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Yeshua is claiming that He and Yahweh are one in the same. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding and dwelling in me, does his works. Trust in and rely upon me, that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me. Otherwise, rely on the account of the works themselves. 
the Messiah performed countless miracles to confirm his deity. This is trustworthy, what I say to you. He who trusts in and relies upon me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I traverse and go to the Father. And whatever you ask or require, in my name and authority, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, you will keep an eye on my prescriptions. That brings us to John 14.16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give and bestow upon you a intercessor, an advocate and comforter, that he may abide and indwell you forever. That is the set-apart spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not know does not discern, experience, consider, or behold Him, or know or understand Him, but you know and understand Him, because He abides and dwells with you, and I will be in you. I will not leave you bereaved, comfortless or fatherless. I will come back and enter you. After a little while the world will see me no longer. Yeshua is predicting his crucifixion. But you will experience, behold, and look upon me, because I live. He's predicting his resurrection. You will live also. That's the gospel. We get to live forever with Yeshua, because he sacrificed himself as a payment for our sins. It's the final solution. In that day you shall know and understand that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The Spirit of the Messiah, Yeshua, is the set-apart Spirit, and is Yahweh. They are three manifestations of the same thing, just as our height, width, and depth are three manifestations of our physical body. So rather than prescribing the arrival of an Arab terrorist who is long dead, Yeshua was promising us that His eternal Spirit will reside within us. In all of the Bible, it's hard to imagine Islam picking verses more damaging to their claims. Meanwhile, back in Medina, the mean, angry, intolerant, and racist false prophet behaved as the Bible predicted he would. Quran 5, verse 13. But because of their breach of their covenant, we cursed them and made their hearts grow hard. They changed the words from their right places, the illiterate prophet pronounced, and forget and abandon a good part of the message that was sent them, nor will you cease to find deceit in them. It's the time bomb of Islam. They change the words from their right places and forget and abandon a good part of the message that was sent them. In another translation we find the God who breached the covenant of Hudabayah preaching. And because of their breaking their covenant, we have cursed them and made hard their hearts. They altered words from their context and they neglected a portion of the message they were reminded of. There is even ambiguity between the translations. The first was written in the present tense, as if the editing were ongoing. The second was written in the past tense, as if the alterations were history. So the bottom line is, Islam is clueless. Muhammad didn't know what changed. He didn't know when it changed, or why it changed, because it didn't change. The Jews told Muhammad that his version of their Torah was preposterous. Christians had done the same with regards to his errant recasting of Yeshua. Both knew that Muhammad wasn't a prophet, that Allah wasn't Yahweh, and that the Quran didn't confirm Yahweh's scriptures. This placed Muhammad in an impossible position. Every literate and godly person around him was calling him a liar, his god a fraud, and his revelations fictitious. The Quran was clear. Mohammed purchased Talmud stories from the Jews in Medina. When Mohammed, 
changed the words from their right places and forgot a good part of the message. They held him accountable. They mocked him, rejected him, and disbelieved him. This tormented him. The Jews knew he hadn't received the surahs from Gabriel or from God. They held the receipts. This is why they had to be eliminated. The evidence and the people who held it had to be obliterated before they obliterated Islam. The Nadir and Kareza were hunted down and slaughtered to keep you and me from knowing the truth. It is why Mohammed mustered the largest raids of his life against Christians. Mohammed's claim is impossible to defend. The people of the book, the children of Israel, the Jews, could not have changed the words from their right places and forgot a good part of the message, nor could they have altered words from their context and neglected a portion of the message they were reminded of, unaltered, unchanged, unforgotten, and rightly placed words, scribed on scrolls comprising the Bible, were discovered in Qumran, dating back to 250 B.C., fully a thousand years before the oldest surviving Quran. On them we find Yahweh's name written 7,000 times, and Allah's not even once. We find no reference to religion, much less to the religion of Abraham, Adam, or Noah. Despite what Allah claims, Lot, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Saul, David, and Solomon weren't Muslims. There is no mention of Mecca or the Kaaba in the scriptures, and yet stories of Jerusalem and the temple abound. It is absurd to believe that more than a thousand years before an illiterate megalomaniac a perverted pedophile, a profiteering pirate, a bloodthirsty terrorist emerged in Arabia that pious Jewish scribes purposely altered the whole of their scriptures just to foil him. The scope of their conspiracy would have to have gone beyond millions of people plotting together to write Yahweh, Messiah, Jew, Jerusalem, and Temple into the record and Allah, Muhammad, Muslim, Mecca, and the Kaaba out tens of thousands of times. All of Middle Eastern history, 4,000 years of it, from Persia to Egypt, would have had to have been perverted too, for the Bible to be as errant as the Quran requires it to be. Yet no scholar, historian, or archaeologist has ever discovered any artifact to suggest that the Bible is in error. In fact, the opposite is true. Moreover, Yahweh's Ten Commandments and His message of choice, of love, relationship, and atonement are nowhere to be found in Allah's mean-spirited and immoral rant. So the Quran's central claim is impossible. That means Islam cannot possibly be true. There is a reason Muhammad, the Quran, and Muslim scholars don't explain how, when, or why Jews altered words from their context and neglected part of the message. They can't, because the Jews didn't. Some have said, it doesn't matter what you believe, only that you believe. We all worship the same God, and there are many paths to Him. That's like saying that it doesn't matter if a bridge over a gorge will carry your weight, only that you believe it will. To say that we all worship the same God is to say that God is schizophrenic. He's so stupid he can't remember his name or his message. And how can opposite paths, fear and obey, versus choose to love, lead to the same place? It isn't tolerant to allow or encourage someone to risk his or her life on a bridge that is obviously faulty. Their faith will only get them killed. Faith in the wrong object is fatal. Quran 5, verse 14. From those, too, who call themselves Christians, we made a covenant, but they forgot and abandoned a good part of the message that was sent to them. So we estranged them, stirred up enmity and hatred among them to the day of doom. Soon will Allah show them the handiwork they have done. The Christian scriptures are comprised of the most prolifically and contemporaneously documented writings in all of antiquity. 
there are a thousand times more manuscript fragments dating ten times closer to the events they describe than there are for the second best documented book, the Iliad by Homer. Further, the central message of the Gospels is salvation through the Messiah's sacrifice, something Islam denies. Yeshua preached love, not fear, relationship, not jihad. The Gospel message is as different from the Quran as any two books ever written. To say that Allah delivered both messages makes Muhammad too stupid for words, or barring that, as deceitful as the devil. You'd think that after twenty-two years of making these things up, Muhammad would have come up with a more credible story. But at least the Bible and Quran have one thing in common. They are both focused on Jews. Quran 5, verse 15. O people of the book, there has come to you our apostle, revealing to you much that you used to hide in your scripture, suppressing and passing over much. There has come to you from Allah a new light, Muhammad, and a clear book. Allegedly the Quran. Although it's a detail, it warrants mentioning. Not a word of this was written. The one man who tried had been murdered. The Quran wasn't a book, nor would it become one for quite some time. And even when it was finally committed to paper, it would be poorly written, plagiarized, contradictory, racist, immoral, demented, violent, out of chronological order, devoid of context, and inaccurate. Simply stated, the Quran became the worst book ever written. It inspires the hellish behavior we have come to know as terrorism. No smarter than the black stone which he had the audacity to say was his inspiration. Islam's lone troubadour teaches, In Quran 5 verse 18, The Jews and the Christians say, We are sons of Allah and his beloved. Say, Why then does he punish you for your sins? Nay, you are but men. He forgives whom he wishes and punishes whom he pleases. Just like Satan, Muhammad was fixated on destroying his competition. Yet to do so, he had to rebuke the very doctrines that provided the material for his Quran. But he couldn't even get his facts right. While the nature of the relationship between man and Yahweh, according to Scripture, is father-son, Christians don't go so far as to say that we are Yahweh's biological sons, nor do Jews. Furthermore, and this may come as a surprise, Yahweh doesn't punish men and women for their sins. Sinners who have not chosen to accept His gift of eternal life, and have chosen not to form a relationship with Him, are kept separate, consistent with their choosing. That place of separation is called Hades. By definition, hell is where unsaved sinners are and where Yahweh is not. Therefore, God cannot punish sinners because He will be eternally separated from Him. And that's what damnation and forsaken mean. Ignorance and arrogance are a deadly combination. This next verse proves Mohammed and his pal Lucifer suffered from both. Moses was a great leader and liberator, but he never considered himself a prophet. Yahweh prepared Moses for the job because he wanted the best educated Jew on the planet to lead his people. Yahweh wanted to dictate his covenant and his instructions to a literate man. Quran 5 verse 20 Remember, Moses said to his people, O my people, call in remembrance the favor of Allah unto you, when he produced prophets among you and made you kings. The first Jewish prophet wouldn't write, and the first Jewish king wouldn't reign, for another four hundred years. Moses could not have said what Allah attributes to him. So this is another Quranic lie. And he gave you what he had not given to any other among the people, O oh, my people, enter the holy land which Allah has assigned to you. And Muslims want to steal from you. And turn not back, for surely you turn back as losers. You will be overthrown, ruined. How, pray tell, 
Can Allah be God, Arabs be God's chosen people, Muhammad be God's favored messenger, and Mecca be sacred territory? If Yahweh had Moses lead the Jews out of bondage and then ultimately into the Holy Land of Israel, not Arabia. This should be a watershed moment for Muslims and those who coddle them in the misguided spirit of political correctness. If you have managed to ignore or justify the mountain of evidence confirming Muhammad's criminal and immoral past, now you have to commit intellectual suicide. Quran 5.20 is historically impossible, and thus it is untrue. If the Quran never mentioned the Bible, we would have to render our verdict against Islam based solely upon Allah's demented and delusional nature and Muhammad's grotesque behavior. But the Quran refers to the Bible, its patriarchs and prophets, several thousand times. The Quran says that the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels were given to Moses, David, and Jesus by Allah himself, and yet he can't even plagiarize them intelligently. You can make several choices without committing intellectual suicide. You can choose to believe that there is no God. You can believe that there might be a God, but that He is unknowable. That would make us a chemistry experiment with which He has grown bored. You can believe that Yahweh is God, and that He revealed Himself in the Scriptures through Yeshua and by His Spirit, as I do. But you cannot rationally believe that Allah, the dim-witted, delusional, and demented spirit depicted in the Quran, is God. Thus, Islam's religious credentials are bogus. Since Islam is spiritually bankrupt, the free peoples of the world are actually aiding and abetting murder when they allow an obviously false doctrine to continue poisoning millions of minds. It is a crime to write something that incites men to murder. Islam is criminal. Like Nazism, Islam is a scourge on humanity. Islam must be exposed, it must be repudiated, and it must be eliminated. A dozen verses wallow in a polluted retelling of the Exodus and Cain and Abel stories, as if one followed the other. They are interesting because they are plagiarized from the same book Muhammad just got through desecrating. If you're curious, I cover the passage on page 53 of the source material appendix. Then, without intelligible transition, we leave the Bible, actually the Mishnah Sanhedrin, and return to the central theme of the Quran. In his most pugnacious and inhuman utterance, the molested orphan orders Muslims to molest the world. Quran 5.33 The punishment for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive after corruption, making mischief in the land... Those who refuse to surrender to Islam, and specifically Jews, who are called mischief makers throughout the Quran, is murder, execution, crucifixion, the cutting off of hands and feet on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. That is their degradation and disgrace in this world, and a great torment of an awful doom awaits them in the hereafter. Quran 5.33 is the most torturous verse ever issued in the name of religion. Making mischief, a war of words, is sufficient to warrant imprisonment, mutilation, assassination, and crucifixion. Those who reject Islam are to be humiliated and to be maimed, having their hands and feet cut off so that they might be disgraced. And this is the last surah. These tortured words weren't abrogated. This is Muhammad's parting shot at the world that had tormented him. The fifth surah is Islam's legacy. And as a result, the Sudan, today's most fundamental Islamic nation, has murdered and mutilated three million Christians over the past fifteen years. Islam remains as Muhammad conceived it. Muslim apologists argue that repentance prohibits these tortures and that Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Quran 5.34 Except for those who repent and become Muslims, before you overpower them and they fall under your control, in that case know that Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. But consider the price. Consider the context. 
Repentance requires surrender to Islam, obedience to Muhammad, and the acceptance of his deity. That's why the King Fahd edition of the Noble Quran inserted the words and become Muslims inside of the parenthesis. And this capitulation only works if it's done prior to being overpowered or conquered by brute force. By ordering his followers to torture men, Allah became nothing more than a molesting thug. He became Muhammad. Quran 533 and 34 provide a synopsis of Islam's message. Men are not persuaded into Islam. They are forced into submission. Allah began his final surah announcing he had chosen submission as man's religion. Now he is explaining the means he intends to use to impose his choice. That means is terror. Execution, crucifixion, mutilation, and imprisonment are not intellectual or spiritual inducements. This passage highlights why the real God hates religion. Evil men create perverse and deceitful doctrines to coerce capitulation, to excuse murder and mayhem, and they use religion to control men's lives so that cleric and king might prosper. All the while, their co-conspirator, Satan, uses religion to deceive mankind, separating us from our Creator. The deception, death, and damnation of man is the devil's life ambition. Yahweh based his relationship with us on choice. We choose what to believe and in whom to trust. He recognized that love cannot be forced. Submission is the antithesis of the scriptural message. One cannot love what one fears. Biblically, the Hebrew yare means revere in reference to God, not fear. Love cannot be seduced either, as a loving relationship is based upon open disclosure, truth, not deception. This is why Muhammad's cravings were never satisfied. In this regard, Yahweh and Allah could not be more different. Quran 5.35 Believers fear Allah and seek the way to approach Him, striving hard. Fighting jihad with all your might in his cause, deception, death, and damnation, that you may be successful, as for the disbelievers, previously defined in this surah as Christians, if they had everything on earth two times over to give as ransom for the penalty of the day of doom, it would never be accepted from them. Theirs will be a painful torment. They will desire to get out of the fire, but they shall not be released from it. They shall have an everlasting punishment. The thirteenth chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians does a better job of explaining why Mohammed failed than any words I could ever write. It serves to expose how dissimilar Mohammed's recital was from the Messiah's gospel. The opening line is even prophetic, as Mohammed, the boy who was unloved and never learned to love, claimed to have spoken for angels and to have received his message as a clanging bell. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy, and know all mysteries, and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it promises me nothing. Love is patient, it is kind, and it is not jealous. Love does not brag, and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Not fear, not fighting, not terror, nor booty, neither submission nor obedience, not painful punishments or hateful tirades. Love, nothing more, nothing less.
Returning to the Quran, we discover that Allah prefers torture to love, and while civilized man has advanced three thousand years from the time Hammurabi's laws were first pressed into clay tablets, Allah prefers the Stone Age. Yet it's fitting. It's where the black stone belongs. Quran 5, verse 37. The Christian disbelievers will long to get out of the fire, but they will never get out from there, and theirs will be an enduring torture. Verse 38. And as to the thief, male or female, cut off his or her hands, a punishment by way of example from Allah. Allah is mighty, wise. For a rock. But if the thief repents after his crime and amends his conduct, Allah turns to him in forgiveness. So, if you say you're sorry, you can steal all you want. Quran 5 verse 41. Messenger, let not those rejectors and mockers grieve you. They race each other into unbelief among those who say, We believe with their lips, but whose hearts have no faith. Allah is rebuking the bad Muslims who, like bad Nazis, pretended to go along with the program to stay alive. Or it be among the Jews, men who will listen to any lie. They change the context of the words from their right times and places. Muhammad is once again projecting his faults onto the Jews. The Bible is the most historically accurate ancient document the world has ever known. Every story is set within the context of time and place. It is his Quran that has no context and is devoid of times and places. By way of example, I present the second half of this verse. They say, if you are given this, take it, but if not, beware. If anyone's temptation is intended by Allah's desires, you have no authority in the least from him against Allah. For it is not Allah's will to purify their hearts. For them there is disgrace in this world, and in the hereafter a heavy punishment. This is absolute gibberish without context. The most that can be deciphered from the verse is that Allah is once again acting like the devil. Another translation reads, Whomever Allah wants to deceive, you cannot help. It goes on to say, Allah does not want them to know the truth, because he intends to disgrace them and then torture them. Lurking behind the veil of Islam is none other than Satan, the adversary. While that might sound harsh and intolerant, it remains the only rational conclusion. The presentation of Allah's character and ambition in the Quran doesn't leave us any other choice. By prostrating themselves to Allah and fighting jihad in Allah's cause, Muslims have surrendered to Satan. They are doing the devil's business. While the Quranic evidence is overwhelming, the Prophet's Sunnah or example serves as proof. And the river of blood that has flowed from the mantra of the black stone serves as a harsh and vivid confirmation. It isn't by chance that good Muslims are 2,000% more violent than the rest of us. It isn't by accident that terror and Islam are irrevocably and undeniably linked. It isn't a coincidence that Allah's enemies are Yahweh's chosen. Muhammad, speaking of the Jews he had plundered, said on behalf of the spirit that possessed him. In Quran 5 verse 42, They are fond of listening to falsehood, of devouring anything forbidden. They are greedy for illicit gain. If ever a verse was guilty of projecting one's faults upon a foe, this is it. It defines hypocrite. The man, or God, went on to lie. Quran 5.44 It was we who revealed the Torah to Moses. By its standard the prophets judged the Jews, and the prophets bowed in Islam to Allah's will surrendering. For the rabbis and the priests, to them was entrusted the protection of Allah's scripture book, and they were witnesses of it. Therefore fear not men, but fear me, and sell not my revelations for a miserable price. How do you suppose that a God who jumps between first and third person, who can't remember his name, or if he is singular or plural, could have revealed the Torah? And if he revealed it, why couldn't he protect it from change? 
More important, since Allah claims that his Quran was written before time began, and that it was perfect revelation, why did he even bother with the Torah? Moreover, if Allah was such a great and prolific revealer, why did Muhammad have to buy his scripture revelations for a miserable price? Continuing to prove his lack of divinity, Allah proclaims in Quran 5.46, And in their footsteps we sent Isa, their Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law that had come before him. We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light, and confirmation of the law that had come before him, a guidance to those who fear Allah. The gospels were written about the Messiah, not given to him. The first, Mark, was written twenty years after the resurrection. The last, John, was composed some thirty years later. And since the gospel fulfills the Torah by confirming its prophecies, why does the Quran reject that fulfillment in its entirety? And why does it contradict its central message? It's as if the author of the Quran were ignorant of the scriptures he was trying to plagiarize and then condemn. It's also interesting that Esau, Arabic for Esau, is the one person whom Yahweh calls out by name in his scriptures to condemn. He says of Esau that he and his descendants will be destroyed. Arabic was perfectly capable of rendering the Messiah's name accurately as Yeshua, but instead they chose to call the Messiah Esau. While I do not take my directions from the former Meccan moon god, the following advice is sound up to a point. Quran 5.47 Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. If any fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. If I were a Muslim... I would question why my God, who claims to have personally created Esau by breathing his spirit into him and then given him the gospel, knows nothing of him or it. While I know why he is ignorant of such things, the paradox ought to trouble Muslims. The answer is, there were no Christians living in Medina from whom to purchase or purloin gospel quotes. While I have shared many excerpts from the scriptures in an effort to challenge the foolishness of the Quranic corruptions of them, I haven't had to delve into the New Covenant in rebuttal simply because Muhammad didn't know it well enough to twist its accounts. His gospel presentation was wholly his own. In one surah, Muhammad makes up a story about Mary being adopted and attributes Moses' father to her. In another, he says that Jesus babbled in the cradle and was resurrected, but he was not crucified. In the Hadith, he claims that the Messiah raised Ham and discussed the problem of poop in the ark. Muhammad didn't plagiarize or twist these stories. He simply imagined them. Quran 5.48 To you, Christians, we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scriptures that came before it, and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what Allah has revealed. Mission accomplished. We have judged between them and found Muhammad guilty of counterfeiting scripture. And to add insult to injury, he had his dim-witted deity say that he sent the scripture in truth and guarded it safely. If that's true, the gospel and the Quran should be the same, not polar opposites. Fearing that he had made a fool of himself, Muhammad added a caveat after his second challenge. Quran 5 verse 49 And this he commands, Judge between them by what Allah has revealed, and follow not their Christian desires. But beware of them, lest they beguile you, seducing you away from that which Allah hath sent down to you. And if they turn you away from being Muslims, be assured that for their crime it is Allah's purpose to smite them. Truly most men are rebellious. This is a very strange passage, since Allah claims that he revealed the Christian Gospels. Yet in the same breath, he tells Muslims not to follow the Christians who have based their faith upon them. If Allah had revealed the Gospels, their message could not beguile or seduce Muslims away from Islam. So somebody isn't telling the truth. 
If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Quran 5.51 Believers take not Jews and Christians for your friends. They are but friends and protectors to each other. You'd think that Allah would occasionally get something right. But this is just another ignorant mistake. Jews and Christians were antagonistic when this was revealed, and they remain so for another thousand years. Quran 5.57 Believers take not for friends those who take your religion for a mockery, or a sport, or a joke, whether among those who receive the scriptures before you, or among those who reject faith, but fear Allah. In other words, don't hang out with rational people. This would be funny if they weren't killing us. The Islamic God believed that he turned Jews into apes and into pigs. Quran 5.59 Say, shall I point out to you something much worse than this by the treatment it received from Allah? Those who incurred the curse of Allah and his wrath, those of whom he transformed into apes and swine. A wise Jew must have said that a swine had made monkeys of men. Quran 5.64 The Jews say Allah's hands are fettered. As do I. If Allah is Yahweh, why can't he do any of the miracles with which he so vividly demonstrated his power throughout the Bible? Have Allah's hands become fettered? For a new religion, Islam seems fixated on old ones. And for a tolerant dogma, it is overly intent on condemning others. Mohammed protests, Be their hands tied up, and be they accursed for the blasphemy they utter. Nay, both his hands are widely outstretched, giving Muslims Jewish booty, as he pleases. Amongst them we have placed enmity and hatred till the day of doom. Every time they kindle the fire of war, Allah does extinguish it, but they strive to do mischief on earth. It had been 1,500 years since the Jews had fought offensively, and it would be nearly that long before they would fight again. Banished from the promised land by the Assyrians, Babylonians, and most recently Romans, the Jews were just trying to survive, to get along. They were among the least mischievous people on the planet. It was Mohammed's militants who spiked the mischief scale. They had lied and looted in the process of kindling the fires of war, seventy-five times in the first nine years of the Islamic era. Quran 5.65 If only the people of the book had believed, we should indeed have blotted out their evil deeds of rejecting and mocking and admitted them to the gardens of bliss. Not knowing enough to be lucid, Muhammad takes a lame swipe at assaging his conscience by inferring that the plight of the Jews wasn't his fault. If only they had observed the Torah, the Gospel, and all the revelation that was sent to them from their Lord, they would have enjoyed happiness from every side. While it's true the Jews would have been happier if they had followed their Torah and accepted the Gospel, Allah makes a fool of himself by saying it because he repudiates the Torah, dismantling the Ten Commandments, and his prophet's behavior was the antithesis of the message proclaimed by Yeshua. As a result, the Jews were besieged on every side by the Islamic terrorists who, in the name of Allah, stole their homes and possessions, murdered their men, raped their women, and enslaved their children. Goebbels proposed a theory which states, If a lie were repeated often enough and long enough, it would come to be perceived as truth. It is true today. Virtually everyone, Muslim, Christians, and Jews, political leaders, media spokesmen, and common folk, are befuddled by Islam. They view Kusay's Kaaba Inc. and Khadija's profitable profit plan as a religion. They think it's peaceful and tolerant because other religions are peaceful and tolerant. It's innocence by association. They believe that Allah is God and that Islam is one of many paths to Him. As a result, over a billion Muslims live in religious, economic, intellectual, and political poverty, and five billion others live in fear of them. 
Islamic terrorism runs amok because Islam runs amok, and Islam runs amok because non-Muslims tolerate it. Quran 567 Messenger, deliver the message which has been sent to you from your Lord. If you do not, you will not have delivered his message, and Allah will protect you from people. The opening lines are too dumb for words, much less scripture, and the last is too sinister to be believed. Why does Allah need to promise to protect his delivery boy? Is Muhammad a coward? Is he so insecure that mocking, ridicule, and rejection have overwhelmed him? Or is the messenger afraid that he who lives by spewing poison will die by being poisoned? Ever the hypocrite, Allah's poison pen proclaims, Quran 5.68 Say, O people of the scripture book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you observe the Torah, or Torah, the Injil, or Gospel, and all of the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Muhammad's recitals. It is the revelation of the Quran that comes to you from your Lord is certain to increase the rebellion and blasphemy, but grieve you not over these unbelieving people. It's another Islamic verse. Allah's scripture causes people to rebel against God. And the reason is that Muhammad never understood the Torah's place in the Hebrew scriptures or the gospel's role in the renewed covenant, much less their relationship to one another. Before we press on, I'd like you to consider the 98th surah, one revealed about this time. Allah said Christianity and Judaism were false religions. Quran 98 verse 1 Those among the people of the book who disbelieve and are idolaters making Christians and Jews pagans would never have been freed from their false religion if the clear proofs had not come to them. An apostle of Allah came reading out of hallowed pages containing firm decrees they were commanded to serve Allah exclusively, fulfilling their devotional obligations and paying the zakat. Surely the unbelievers and idolaters from the people of the book will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. So I pose this question to the world's cadre of Islamic scholars. If Quran 569 is testimony to Islamic tolerance, why does Quran 98.1 contradict it? Further, if Allah was Yahweh, why isn't there an order for fighting in His cause, for paying the zakat, or for observing holy months, for performing devotional obligations, for Ramadan fasting, or for participating in the Hajj pilgrimage in the Ten Commandments? And while we're on the subject of Exodus 20, most everything Muhammad did violated Yahweh's commands. How could that be if the Quran confirmed the Torah? How can Judeo-Christianity be a false religion if Allah revealed it and then He confirmed it? Preoccupied with the Jews, the Arab God attacks them again. Quran 5, verse 70. We took a solemn pledge from the children of Israel and sent messengers to them. But every time a messenger came bringing something that did not suit their mood, they called one an imposter, another they slew. They imagined that there would be no trial or punishment, so they became willfully blind and deaf. Muhammad is inferring that the Jews called him an imposter and that they slew Christ. But that's a problem for Islam because the Quran claims that their Jesus wasn't killed, and history confirms that while he was crucified, the Jews didn't do it. These next two verses, combined with Quran 5.17 and 98.1, condemn Christians to endure the cutting edge of Islamic terror forever. Throughout the Quran's most violent surahs, the 4th, 5th, 8th, 9th, 33rd, 47th, 48th, 59th, 60th, and 61st, Muhammad uses the words infidel, unbeliever, and disbeliever to describe his enemy. Then in the fifth surah, the prophet defined his terms. Infidels, unbelievers, and disbelievers became Christians, and thus they inherited the legacy of Islam's sword. While it was ingenious and efficient, it was also transparent and immoral. 
Muhammad had robbed, enslaved, and killed every significant Jewish settlement in Arabia. After enduring ten years of terror, the Quraysh had surrendered, as had most every Arab town within Islam's reach. There was nothing left to steal, but having turned self-sufficient and peaceful men into bloodthirsty pirates, Muhammad needed a new enemy. So, in Quran 5.72, They are surely infidels who blaspheme and say, God is Christ, the Messiah, the Son of Mary. But the Messiah only said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Now that the Quran has brought the 14th chapter of John's Gospel to our attention, we know that Christ, the Messiah, claimed that he was God. Thus, Allah is doing what he does best, lie. Lo, whoever joins other gods with Allah, or says he has a partner, Allah has forbidden paradise, and the hell fire will be his abode. There will, for the wrongdoers, be no one to help. Quran 5.73 They are surely disbelievers, who blaspheme and say, God is one of the three in the Trinity, for there is no Illah, or God, except one Allah. If they desist not from this saying, this blasphemy, verily a grievous penalty will befall them. The disbeliefers will suffer a painful doom. What that said, Christian must now be substituted for infidel and disbeliever in every verse commanding Muslims to fight, kill, terrorize, plunder, or enslave. Must because of Quranic abrogation, Surah 2.106 proclaims. Whenever we cancel a verse or throw it into oblivion, we bring one which is better. The fifth surah was the last handed down, and thus its commands and definitions abrogate all others. The result is as clear as the skies over New York at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on the 11th of September, 2001. I'm sorry to be the bearer of such bad news, but this is why Muslims kill Americans. They believe we are Christians. The profitless prophet, the miracleless apostle, the illiterate messenger of Scripture, Latin for writing, felt the need to disparage the Messiah and his mission once more. Quran 5.75 The Messiah, Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. His mother was a woman of truth. They had to eat their food. See how Allah does make his signs clear to them, yet see in what ways they are deluded. Speaking of deluded, the Quran previously revealed that Jesus didn't pass away. We were told that Allah raised him. Quran 4, 157. We, Jews, killed the Messiah, Jesus, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. It appeared so to them, as the resemblance of Jesus was put over another man, and they killed that man. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself. Those who differ with this version are full of doubts. They have no knowledge and follow nothing but conjecture, for surely they killed him not. The impotent Islamic God had the nerve to grumble. Quran 5.76 Say, will you serve something that has no power either to harm or benefit you? This is followed by something that, considering the context of the Islamic Hadith, may be the most hypocritical statement yet spoken. Quran 577 Say, Muhammad, people of the book, exceed not in your religion the bounds of what is proper, trespassing beyond truth, nor follow the vain desires of people who erred in times gone by, who led many astray. Rotten to the bitter end, the Quran protests. In Quran 5, verse 78, Curses were pronounced on the unbelievers, the children of Israel who rejected Islam, by the tongues of David and Jesus, because they disobeyed and rebelled. Verse 80. You see many of them allying themselves with the unbelievers. Other translations read, infidels. Vile indeed are their souls. Allah's wrath is on them, and in torment they will abide. Quran 581. If only they had believed in Allah in the prophet, and in what had been revealed to him. Verse 82. 
you will find the Jews and disbelievers defined as Christians in 573 the most vehement in hatred for the Muslims. Not only are Jews and Christians vile, according to Allah, and thus destined for eternal torment, their leaders, David and Jesus, will be the ones cursing them. This is too weird for words. The last half of the 82nd verse concludes with these contradictory ideas. It's as if Mohammed hadn't been listening to his own vitriolic diatribe. And nearest among them in affection to the believers will you find those who say, We are Christians, because amongst these are priests and monks, men devoted to learning who have renounced the world and are not arrogant. I can almost hear the false prophet of Revelation fame, the pontiff of the one world religious order that sweeps the globe during the last days, quoting this verse, out of context, of course. And how, pray tell, can Christians be nearest in affection to the believers if Quran 5.51 is true? Believers, take not Jews and Christians for your friends. They are friends to each other. He who befriends them becomes one of them. Lo, Allah guides not wrongdoing folk. Or how do priests and monks renounce the world if Quran 9.34 were true? Believers, there are indeed many among the priests who in falsehood devour the wealth of mankind and wantonly debar men from the way of Allah. They who hoard gold and silver and spend it not in Allah's cause unto them give tidings of a painful doom. Still speaking of Christians, the people he gleefully called vile and condemned to hell, the schizophrenic God lies. Quran 5.83 and when they listen to the revelation received by this messenger, you will see their eyes overflowing with tears, for they recognize the truth. They pray, Our Lord, we believe. Write us down among the witnesses. In this very same surah, we're told in the 14th verse, From those who call themselves Christians we made a covenant, but they forgot and abandoned a good part of the message that was sent to them. So we estranged them, stirred up enmity and hatred among them to the day of doom. Soon will Allah show them the handiwork they have done. Team Islam is very confused. Quran 5.84 What reason can we, Christians, have not to believe in Allah and the truth which has come to us, seeing that we long for our Lord to admit us to the company of the good people? I'll take a stab at that one. Good Muslims are killing Christians because their messenger and their God commanded them to wipe them out to the last. The Quran denies the Messiah's entire mission, his sacrifice, and his deity. Then there's the fact that Muhammad was a rotten scoundrel. Quran 586, But those who reject Islam are the disbelievers, denying our signs and revelations. They shall be the owners of the hell fire. Ah, there's good news. At least Muhammad's Muslims won't steal everything from the Christians. We'll still own the hell fire. Coming from a man whose own father was spared by divination arrows, from a man who cast lots to determine which of his wives would accompany him on raids, one who kissed and fondled a stone, and one who claimed that the rivers of paradise flowed with wine. This next verse is entertaining. Quran 5, verse 90. Believers, intoxicants and gambling, dedication of stones and divination by arrows, are an abomination. They are Satan's handiwork. Shun such abominations that you may prosper. Satan's plan is to excite hostility and hatred between you with wine and gambling and hinder you from the remembrance of Allah and devotional obligations. Therefore, Allah must be Satan since he's responsible for making the rivers of paradise flow with wine. And Allah must be Satan since his Quran excites hostility and hatred. Allah, the black stone, must be Satan because the dedication of stones is satanic to hell with the truth islam was about obedience quran 5 verse 92 obey allah and obey the messenger and beware and islam is about war quran 594 
Believers, Allah will make a test for you in the form of a little game in which you reach out your hands for your lances, that he may know who fears. Any who fails this test will have a grievous penalty, a painful punishment. According to Allah, suicide bombers aren't terrorists. No, they're just boys playing games. And Allah's final test for determining salvation or damnation is based upon whether men reach for their lances or not. While this verse starts off benign, listen to how it ends. Quran 5.95 Kill not game while in the sacred precincts or in pilgrim garb. If any of you do so intentionally, the compensation is an offering brought to the Kaaba of a domestic animal equivalent to the one he killed, that he may taste the penalty of his deed. Allah forgives what is past. For repetition, Allah will exact a penalty. For Allah is the Lord of retribution. Forgetting for a moment that Adam and Abraham are both credited with making the Kaaba. How can there be asylum during the sacred months, when Muhammad launched his conquest of the Kaaba during Ramadan, and proceeded to assassinate a dozen or more souls hiding behind its covers? Quran 597 Allah made the Kaaba, the sacred house, an asylum of security for men, as also the sacred months. Verse 98 Know you that Allah is severe in punishment, and that Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Since by definition, a hypocrite is one who says one thing and does another, Allah has just defined himself. And guess what? He is exactly like Muhammad. This next passage opens with dialogue that's beneath Sesame Street. Quran 5 verse 100 Say, not equal are things that are bad and things that are good, even though there is an abundance of bad to dazzle, please, and attract you. So be careful and fear Allah, O you who understand, so you may prosper. Muslims prosper, according to Allah, because booty is lawful and good. There are two Quranic verses in particular that condemn Muslims to live in religious, economic, intellectual, and civil poverty. One says, Quran 4.89, If they turn back from Islam, becoming renegades, seize them and kill them wherever you find them. The other commands, Quran 5.101, Believers, do not ask questions about things which, if made plain and declared to you, may vex you, causing you trouble. Verse 102, Some people before you did ask such questions, and on that account they lost their faith and became disbelievers. It's true. The Quran is so incomprehensible, so obviously fraudulent, so mean-spirited, anyone who even questions it loses their faith. So we need to give Muslims the freedom to ask questions and to make choices. Questioning minds will reject the Quran because it says things like this. Quran 5, 104. When it is said to them, Come to what Allah has revealed, come to the Messenger, they say, Enough for us are the ways we found our fathers following. What, even though your fathers were void of knowledge and guidance? Kusay founded the religious scam that Muhammad promoted as Islam. How could he have been void of guidance if Allah was his God, the Kaaba was his shrine, the Hajj and the Umrah were his pilgrimages, the prostration, fasts, and sacred months were his rituals, the zakat tax his means, and holy war his method. But there was a man without knowledge. His name was Muhammad. Quran 5.109 one day Allah will gather the messengers together and ask, What was the response you received from men to your teaching? They will say, We have no knowledge. So all of Allah's messengers will be called together and they will say, We don't know anything. The same surah that said, Disbelievers are those who say that God is the third in the Trinity, now proclaims, Quran 5.1.10, And God will say, O oh, Jesus, recount my favor to you and to your mother. Behold, I strengthened you with the Holy Spirit that you spoke to the people in the cradle and in the prime of life. That is the Trinity. God, Yahweh, 
Jesus, Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, Yeshua's Spirit. So I guess that makes the Islamic God a disbeliever. Can't say I blame him. Oh, I taught you the law and the judgment, the Torah and the gospel. Actually, Yahweh revealed the Torah. The Gospels are the good news of freedom from judgment, and they were revealed about him, not taught to him. But even Babe Ruth struck out sometimes. Not finished swinging away wildly, Allah quotes the obscure and irrelevant story of an Egyptian text falsely attributed to Thomas. And behold, you made out of clay, as it were, the figure of a bird, and you breathed into it, and it became a bird by my permission. Trivia aside, Muhammad knew that his God had an embarrassing problem, one that he didn't want to talk about, impotence. He couldn't do a miracle. So to help his God out, Muhammad claimed that the Messiah's miracles were really performed by Allah. And you healed those born blind by my permission, and the lepers by my permission, and behold, you raised forth the dead by my permission. Muhammad not only stole Jewish scripture, possessions, homes, property, wives, and children, he stole their miracles too. But that was enough. He wanted nothing to do with the Messiah's sacrifice. According to the Quran, that crucifixion thing never happened. And behold, I did restrain the children of Israel from harming you when you came with clear proofs. Then to make the Messiah's situation somewhat analogous to his own, Muhammad said, And the unbelievers among the Jews said, This is nothing but pure magic. Delusional to the last breath. Allah claims that the Messiah's disciples were Muslims. I wonder why they didn't say so. Quran 5, 111 And behold, I inspired the disciples to have faith in me and my messenger. They said, We are believers and bear witness that we prostrate ourselves to Allah as Muslims. Surely you jest. But there is an interesting witness here. Throughout the Hebrew Old Covenant and Greek New Covenant, every time prostration is mentioned, it's always attributed to satanic worship. After claiming credit for Christ's best miracles, Allah says that miracles aren't what they're cracked up to be. Quran 5, verse 112. Behold, the disciples said, O Jesus, can your Lord send down to us a table well laid out from heaven? Said Jesus, Fear Allah if you have faith. In other words, no. When the disciples said, O Jesus, Son of Mary, is your Lord able to send down for us a table spread with food from heaven? He said, Observe your duty to Allah if you are true believers. No miracles for you. Since the Quran claims Christ performed miracles, this is senseless. Quran 5, 113. They said, We only wish to eat thereof to satisfy our hearts, and to know you have told us the truth. We want to witness a miracle. Said Jesus, the son of Mary, O Allah our Lord, send us from heaven a table well laid out, that there may be a feast, a sign from you. Ever in character, Allah promises and then threatens. Quran 5, 115. Allah said, I am going to send it down to you, but if any of you after that disbelieves, resisting faith, he's inferring Islam, I will punish him with a torment such as I have not inflicted on any of my creatures, man or jinn. The feast for which this surah is named was never described or even mentioned again, which means it never happened. But just three verses from the Quran's parting salvo, Allah tells Christians, I will punish them with a torment such as I have not inflicted on any of my creatures. Pain and punishment, thievery and terror, savagery and slavery, these are the things which Allah excelled. In that regard, nothing has changed. Twenty-two years earlier, the first Quran revelations were demonic to a fault, fixated on hellish tortures. One hundred and fourteen surahs later, we haven't progressed very far. We are still mired in the realm of doom and damnation. As you know by now, Muhammad was easily confused. Even the Quran said that those around him claimed, 
he was all ear and believes everything he hears. Well, he must have heard some Catholics say, Hail Mary, and came to the conclusion that Christians believed she was a goddess. Quran 5, 1, 16. And behold, Allah will say, O Jesus, the son of Mary, did you say unto men, Worship me and my mother as two gods besides Allah? He will say, Glory to you, never could I utter what I had no right. Wouldn't you know, the man who fancied himself the Messiah finished his recital uttering what he had no right. The second to last verse remains focused on Yeshua, converting him into a Muslim. Quran 5 verse 117 I only said what you, Allah, commanded me to say, Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Then, without benefit of the crucifixion, Yeshua was resurrected. I was a witness over them while I dwelt amongst them, but you took me up. The noble Quran goes on to say, This is a great admonition and warning to the Christians of the whole world. So Islamic salvation is capricious and based upon God's whim, not man's choice. Quran 5, 118 If you punish them, they are your slaves. If you forgive them, you are the Almighty. Having damned Christians and Jews, having condemned their scripture, having ordered Muslims to murder and mutilate them, having converted David and Yeshua to Islam, the Quran's final verse explained what motivated Muhammad to perpetrate Islam in the first place. Quran 5, verse 119. Allah will say, This is the day on which the Muslims will profit from Islam. Since Islam began by corrupting the Bible, I'd like to give Yahweh the last word. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Mark 8.36 Now that we have read Allah's war manifesto, the Quran, it's time to read Muhammad's. Islam's most respected collector of hadith entitles the Prophet's terrorist dogma, Fighting in Allah's Cause, Jihad. The first hadith says it all. We find these in Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52. The first is number 44. A man came to Allah's apostle and said, Instruct me as to such a deed as equals jihad in reward. He replied, I do not find such a deed. If the best thing a Muslim can do is fight jihad in Allah's cause, then Islam is the inverse of peaceful. It is a call to war. Maybe someone should tell the Associated Press or the White House. The Hadith goes on to define jihad as Muslim fighting. It claims jihad is better than obligatory religious ritual. Can you, while the Muslim fighter has gone out for jihad, enter a mosque to perform prayers without ceasing and fast forever? The man said, no one can do that. So jihad reigns supreme. Number 46. I heard Allah's apostle saying, the example of a muhajid, Muslim fighter, in Allah's cause, and Allah knows best who really strives in his cause, is like a person who fasts and prays without ever stopping. Allah guarantees that he will admit the muhajid in his cause into paradise if he is killed. Otherwise, he will return him to his home safely with rewards and war booty. Not only is fighting better than prayer and better than fasting, jihad is a win-win game. If you die, you get heavenly booty. If you live you get earthly booty. Number 50. The prophet said, A single endeavor of fighting in Allah's cause is better than the world and whatever is in it. Jihad, therefore, is more important than all of the five pillars of Islam combined. It's why Muslims are terrorists. The Quran issued its first order to fight jihad in the 109th verse of the second surah. The translators of the Noble Quran wanted to make certain Muslims understood what fighting in the way of Allah meant. So they provided this definition, which is derived entirely from the Quran and Sunnah. Jihad is holy fighting in Allah's cause with full force of numbers and weaponry. It is given the utmost importance in Islam and is one of its pillars. By jihad, Islam is established, Allah's word is made superior, which means only Allah has the right to be worshipped, 
and Islam is propagated. By abandoning jihad, Islam is destroyed, and Muslims fall into an inferior position. Their honor is lost, their lands are stolen, their rule and authority vanish. Jihad is an obligatory duty in Islam on every Muslim. He who tries to escape from this duty, or does not fulfill this duty, dies with one of the qualities of a hypocrite. How could something so clear befuddle so many? Number 63. A man whose face was covered with an iron mask of armor came to the prophet and said, Allah's apostle, shall I fight or embrace Islam first? The prophet said, Embrace Islam first and then fight. So he embraced Islam and was martyred. Allah's apostle said, A little work, but a great reward. Muhammad agrees with my conclusion. There is a causal link between Islam and terror. One leads to the other. Number 65. A man came to the prophet and asked, A man fights for war booty, another fights for fame, and a third fights for showing off. Which of them fights in Allah's cause? The prophet said, He who fights that Allah's word, Islam, should be superior, fights in Allah's cause. Muhammad defined jihad as holy war, and he declared it on all non-Muslims. The motivation for martyrdom has always been as shocking as a suicide bomber's belt. Number 53. The prophet said, Nobody who dies and finds paradise would wish to come back to this life, even if he were given the whole world and whatever is in it, except the martyr who, on seeing the superiority of martyrdom, would like to come back and get killed again in Allah's cause. Number 54. The prophet said, Were it not for the believers who do not want to be without me, I would always go forth in army units setting out for jihad. I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause, and then get resurrected, and get martyred again, only to be resurrected, so that I could get martyred again. Yeah, what this boy would like is to be resurrected, something that will never happen to any Muslim. But there is something that haunts us in this passage. Like the Islamic clerics today... Muhammad sent others out to fight. You never see an Islamic cleric strap on one of the bombs they beguile others to wear. So what I want to know is this. Why don't suicide bombers ask their imams, if this is such a great idea, why aren't you doing it? Number 216. Allah's apostle said, Were it not for fear it would be difficult for my followers, I would not have remained behind in army units. But I don't have riding camels, and I have no other means of conveyance. No doubt I wish I could fight in Allah's cause and be martyred and come back to life and be martyred again. The prophet would have fought non-stop jihad if only he had a riding camel. Number 231. Allah's apostle came to Mecca the day of the conquest, riding his she-camel, on which Usama was riding behind him. Methinks he was a liar and a coward to boot. Bullies usually are. Number 59. Allah's apostle said, By him in whose hands my soul is, whoever is wounded in Allah's cause, and Allah knows well who gets wounded in his cause, will come with his wound having the color of blood but the scent of musk. Sexy blood, only from the mind of Muhammad. And how, pray tell, can Allah's cause be a spiritual struggle if one is wounded? And bleeds. Number 45. Someone asked, Allah's apostle, who is the best among the people? He replied, a believer who strives his utmost in Allah's cause with his life and property, said the imam to the suicide bomber. Number 48. The people said, Allah's apostle, acquaint the people with the good news. He said, Paradise has one hundred grades which Allah has reserved for the Mujahideen who fight in his cause. The distance between each grade is like the distance between the heaven and the earth. This is where the Islamic establishment concocted the idea that if there were multiple virgins for the garden variety suicide bomber, there must be at least seventy for the really excellent killers. Number 311. Allah's apostle said, There is no migration after the conquest of Mecca, but only jihad. When you are called by the Muslim ruler for jihad fighting, you should go forth immediately, responding to the call. Calls for jihad echo off the walls of Muslim mosques to this very day. 
For in Islam there is only jihad. I'd like to pause to clear up a common misconception. Over the course of the 1,000 radio interviews I've done on the subject of Islam and terrorism, Muslims and those who coddle them in the media have mustered only two excuses. They either deny the existence of the 1,000 or more calls for violence you've been confronted with in Prophet of Doom, or they claim that the Bible also contains harsh passages. And so it does. But there are no rewards for fighting, and there are no open orders to fight in Yahweh's scriptures. For every wrathful verse in the Bible, there are a hundred loving and compassionate ones. The inverse is true of Islam. While there are some nurturing quotes in the Quran and Hadith, there are a hundred nasty ones for every positive one. Forgetting for a moment that Quranic violence is a ticket to paradise and that it is rewarded with booty in this world and in the next, Allah's orders are open-ended, condemning all non-Muslims forever. Moreover, the relative frequency of good versus bad is 10,000 times worse in Islam. Simply stated, a Christian must ignore 99% of the Bible and then corrupt the remaining 1%, pulling it out of context, to be violent. Yet a Muslim must ignore 99% of the Quran and Hadith and corrupt the remaining 1% by mistranslating it and extracting it from its context to be peaceful. Number 66. Allah's Apostle said, Anyone whose feet get covered with dust in Allah's cause will not be touched by the hell fire. Jihad dust is a hell preserver. Number 137. The Prophet said, Paradise is for him who holds the reins of his horse to strive in Allah's cause, with his hair unkempt and his feet covered with dust. If he is appointed to the front line, he is perfectly satisfied with his post. And if he's appointed to the rear, he accepts it. Jihad dust is the stuff of destiny. And I suppose that is why angels are dusty too. Number 68. When Allah's apostle returned from the battle of the trench, he put down his arms and took a bath. Then Gabriel, whose head was covered with dust, came to him saying, You have put down your arms. By Allah, I have not put down my arms yet. Allah's apostle said, where to go now? Gabriel said, This way, pointing toward the tribe of the Kareza. So Allah's apostle went out towards them. This is why the Quran tells us that the Islamicized Gabriel, better known as Satan, was the enemy of the Jews, in Quran 2.97. Number 280. When the Kareza were ready to accept Saad's judgment, the apostle sent for him. I give the judgment that their men should be killed and their children and women should be taken prisoner. The prophet remarked, O oh, Saad, you have judged them with the judgment of King Allah. And Muslims slaughtered 1,000 Jews in genocidal rage. They raped their women and sold every child into slavery. Book 51, number 47. What causes you to smile, O oh, Allah's apostle? He said, Some of my followers who in a dream were presented to me as fighters in Allah's cause on board a ship amidst the sea caused me to smile. Allah's cause made the profiteer money, and boatloads of money made him smile. Number 72. Our prophet told us about the message of our Lord. Whoever amongst us is killed will go to paradise. Umar asked the prophet, Is it not true that our men who are killed will go to paradise and the pagans will go to the hell fire? The prophet said, Yes. And they believed him. Pity. Number 73. Allah's apostle said, Know that paradise is under the shade of swords. Well, Muhammad's is, anyway. Although this begins like the setup to a joke, it isn't funny. Number 80. Muhammad said, Allah welcomes two men with a smile, one of whom kills the other, and both of them enter paradise. One fights in Allah's cause and gets killed. Later on, Allah forgives the killer, who also gets martyred in Allah's cause. Then Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Number 282 says, Allah's Apostle said, Five are regarded as martyrs. They are those who die because of plague abdominal disease, drowning, a falling building, and the martyrs in Allah's cause. What on earth would possess a man to say such a thing? Or why would he ask someone to scribble this down on a bone? Number 284 and 285. 
When the divine inspiration, Quran Surah, those of the believers who sit at home, was revealed, the Prophet sent for Zayed, who came with a shoulder blade and wrote on it. Zayed said, Maktum came to the Prophet while he was dictating the verse. Maktum said, O oh, Allah's Apostle, if I were able, I would take part in jihad. He was a blind man. So Allah sent down revelation to his apostle while his thigh was on mine. It became so heavy that I feared my leg would be broken. But the prophet's state was over after Allah revealed, except those who are disabled, blind, or lame. It was Muhammad's greatest miracle. He made blind men lame and disabled billions more. Number 287. The immigrants and the Ansar said, We are those who have given a pledge of allegiance to Muhammad that we will carry on jihad as long as we live. Number 94. The Prophet said, Whoever spends two things in Allah's cause, his life and his wealth, will be called by all the gatekeepers of paradise. They will say, O oh, so-and-so, come here. Abu Bakr said, O oh, Allah's apostle, such persons will never be destroyed. The Prophet said, I hope you will be one of them. Without dying a martyr, Muhammad couldn't even guarantee his most loyal comrade, his father-in-law, and future caliph, a ticket to Allah's brothel. No wonder Muslims are willing to kill to get in. I only wish they knew that the Islamic paradise was full. Baker's little girl confirmed that her hubby was a passionate jihadist. Number 130. Aisha said, whenever the prophet intended to proceed on a raid, he used to draw lots among his wives and would take the one upon whom the lot fell. Once before setting out for jihad, he drew lots and it fell on me, so I went with him. Well, it's contradictory. The lone, peaceful jihad hadith says. Number 43. Aisha said, O oh, apostle, we consider jihad as the best deed. Should we not fight in Allah's cause? He said, The best jihad for women is the hajj, done as I have done it. Other girls confirmed that they served Islam's leading terrorist. Number 134. We used to take part in holy battles with the Prophet, providing his fighters with water and bringing the killed and wounded back to Medina. If he were alive today, Muhammad would be a member of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, or Al-Qaeda. Number 175. He heard the prophet saying, Paradise is granted to the first batch of my followers who will undertake a naval expedition. The prophet then said, The first army amongst my followers who will invade Caesar's city will be forgiven their sins. It was quite a bargain. You bring me booty, and I will give you paradise. Number 178 and 9. The prophet said, one of the portents of the hour is that you will fight with people wearing shoes made of hair. You will fight the Turks, a broad-faced people with small eyes, red faces, and flat noses. Their faces will look like shields coated with leather. And that sounds more racist than religious. The Ku Klux Klan had nothing on these boys. Number 182 to 184. Allah's apostle invoked evil upon the infidel, saying, O oh Allah, the revealer of the holy book, defeat these people and shake them. Fill the infidels' houses and graves with fire as they busied us, so that we did not perform the prayer until sunset. With words like these, it's easy to see why Islam has caused so much death and destruction. Number 259 Allah's apostle sent us on a mission as an army unit and said, If you find so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, burn both of them with fire. When we intended to depart, Allah's apostle said, I have ordered you to burn so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but only Allah punishes with fire, so if you find them, kill them. The Muhammad-Allah combo continued to do a great Satan impersonation. Number 617. Allah's apostle said, I would order someone to collect firewood and another to lead the prayer. Then I would go from behind and burn the houses of men who did not present themselves at the compulsory congregational prayer. Muhammad is Allah. He loved fire as much as the God he created. In Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Number 260. Ali burnt some people to death, and this news reached Abbas, who said, 
Had I been in his place, I would not have burnt them, as the prophet said. Don't punish anybody with Allah's punishment. No doubt I would have killed them, for the prophet said, If a Muslim discards his religion, kill him. Could somebody please explain how this can be tolerant or peace-loving? Number 196. Allah's apostle said, I have been ordered to fight with the people till they say, None has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Left unchecked, Muslims will continue to kill until all non-Muslims either surrender or die. Democracy and freedom are in conflict with fundamental Islam. Number 203. I heard Allah's apostle saying, We are the last, but will be the foremost to enter paradise. The prophet added, He who obeys me obeys Allah, and he who disobeys me disobeys Allah. He who obeys the chief obeys me, and he who disobeys the chief disobeys me. The imam is like a shelter, for whose safety the Muslims should fight. Whether this hadith confirms that Muhammad was Allah, or that apart from Muhammad there were no orders from Allah, is immaterial. His agenda was served, and to establish his legacy and to damn the world, he ordered Muslims to be obedient to Islamic clerics and kings forever. The only way to free Muslims from tyranny and non-Muslims from jihad is to abolish Islam. According to Muhammad, Islam and jihad were inseparable. Number 208. My brother and I came to the Prophet and asked to migrate. He said, Migration has passed away. I replied, For what will you accept our Pledge of Allegiance? He said, I will take the pledge for Islam and Jihad. That was Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Number 208. Now I've shared this hadith before. It was one of Muhammad's favorites. There are a dozen different variations of it. This one is from Volume 4, Book 52, Number 220. Allah's Apostle said, I have been sent with the shortest expressions bearing the widest meanings, and I have been made victorious with terror. While I was sleeping, the keys of the treasures of the world were brought to me and put in my hand. Allah's Apostle has left the world, and now we are bringing out those treasures. His motivation was booty, his means with terror. As an interesting aside, after I published Prophet of Doom, and then engaged in over 1,500 radio interviews across the nation to expose and to condemn Muhammad and his religion of Islam. The only online site to present the Bukhari Hadith, the one called MSA at the University of Southern California, went back in and edited what they had previously translated, changing this particular Hadith so that it removed the word terror. Number 233. Allah's Apostle forbade people to travel to a hostile country carrying copies of the Quran. This proves that every Islamic conquest was about power, control, and money, not religion. Muhammad didn't care for the Persians. It's amazing that Iranians and Iraqis follow a prophet who wanted them destroyed. Number 190. Allah's Apostle sent a letter to Khosra. When he read the letter, he tore it. The Prophet then invoked Allah to disperse them with full dispersion, to destroy them severely. Showing that he could hate everybody, the religious leader who cursed the Arabs, murdered Jews, and condemned Persians, went after the Byzantine Christians. Number 267. The Prophet said, Khosra will be ruined. There won't be a Persian king after him. Caesar will be ruined. There will be no Caesar after him. You will spend their treasures in Allah's cause. He proclaimed, War is deceit. As a religion, Islam is bankrupt because the currency of faith is truth. However, as a war manifesto and terrorist dogma, Islam is perfect. It even comes complete with handy hints. Use what you steal to equip your militants so that they can steal more. And lie in wait. It makes conquering and plundering easier. Number 268. Allah's Apostle said, War is deceit. When you combine this with Quran 8.7, Wipe the infidels out to the last. And Quran 8.39, 
So fight them till all opposition ends, and the only religion is Islam. You get an ongoing state of war that encourages Muslims to continually deceive and murder infidels. This is why they use our media to proclaim jihad is a spiritual struggle and Islam is peaceful. Muslims lie to us while their comrades kill us because their prophet and God ordered them to do these very things. These next hadith demonstrate this principle. Number 270-271 The Prophet said, Who is ready to kill Kab bin al-Ashraf, the Jew who has really hurt Allah and his apostle? Since the Quran says man cannot hurt Allah in any way, Allah is either a liar or he is a man, perhaps both. Maslama said, O oh Allah's apostle, do you want me to kill him? He replied in the affirmative. Maslama said, Then allow me to deceive him. The Prophet said, I allow you. Muslim militants are deploying this same strategy to deceive and kill today. This is how Islam has survived. It is from Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 53, Number 386. Umar sent Muslims to great countries to fight pagans. He said, I intend to invade Persia and Rome. So he ordered us to go to the Persian king, Khosra. When we reached the enemy, Khosra's representative came out with 40,000 warriors saying, Talk to me, who are you? Mugira replied, We are Arabs. We led a hard, miserable, disastrous life. We used to worship trees and stones. While we were in this state, our prophet, the messenger of our Lord, ordered us to fight you till you worship Allah alone or pay us the jizya tribute tax and submission. Our prophet has informed us that our Lord says, Whoever amongst us is killed as a martyr shall go to paradise to lead such a luxurious life as he has never seen, and whoever survives shall become your master. Jihad is Islam's nastiest business. Mm-hmm. 